Good day and good morning, good afternoon, whenever you're watching this, to my students of the Introduction to Music class uh, 110, also the dual enrollment classes that will be watching this. Today, uh, we're going to look at Lesson 2, which I'm posting that material today. And also, before we do that, a couple of house cleaning, cleaning tips. Uh, in Lesson 1, there was some confusion because there were questions in the PowerPoint. Uh, a couple of you answered them as well as doing the test, but I made it, I put in the announcements and I encourage you always to read the announcements that you did not need to answer the questions uh, that are within the PowerPoint, only the questions on the test at the end. And that includes today and all future lessons. Uh, the questions there were really more for, uh, I guess you'd say your own I guess, inner questioning of yourself and to see if you understand what you're reading and look at that. Uh, but you didn't have to write those out and send them. I appreciate that some of you did and the ones I looked at, you were correct in your uh, answers. But um, just do the test at the end of each PowerPoint lesson uh, and then submit that to me. Uh, some folks got a little confused on this also because I had a couple of papers that turned in some of the words, but not all the words. Usually they left out the transcendent, the natural knowing, and supranational natural knowing. Those were left out on several papers. A um, couple of you, it, it hurts your grade somewhat, but don't worry too much. We've got plenty more tests you can make it up, plus you have written assignments that you can do. But like I said, the important thing is all I'm going to ask you to do on, in this class is the test material that's at the end of each lesson. Um, having said that, now let's talk about lesson two. We talked some about the science of sound, but we're going to get a little in depth to it today. Uh, a lot of the previous lesson was talking about how we interpret, how we understand things, and also how our brain reacts to it, particularly uh, the idea of of engaging in art and as we engage we find ourselves experiencing things I like to use the term a sense of awe and that's what we were talking about Otto talked about it Schleiermacher uh, these people are talking about the experience we have in engaging with art today I want to talk about two things in particular uh, one is how we create sound our own human bodies such as what I'm doing now. I'm creating sound. And the other thing is what you're doing, that is you're hearing that sound, interpreting and translating the, the vibrations and hearing. And it's really, uh, I can't say anything other than it's quite miraculous when you think about it. Uh, first, the creation of sound uh, with our human body and our, our throat, and then the actual hearing it, gathering information of these vibrations and taking in. Now, all of this falls under the heading of acoustics, which the acoustics is literally the science of sound. Now, on your slide, you'll see lesson two says, and I'm looking at my slide here, just so sort of like you do. You'll see lesson two, acoustics, hearing and producing a sound. Uh, the first, well, the second slide actually, uh, it says acoustics, the science of sound, and it gives you three aspects. The definition of what a sound is. And, and like I said, you can have different definitions, but for our purposes, a sound is vibrating air molecules. When I speak, I'm vibrating the air molecules right in front of my face and sending them out. In this case, there's a microphone on this camera and it's picking up those vibrations and it's transducing those vibrations into electronic signals and then recording the whole thing. It's a little bit like what we do. A sound is made up of two major aspects. One, there are a couple of terms. The compression wave. Uh, as I create a compression wave, I'm actually forcing those molecule, molecules of air that I've now set in vibration, and I'm pushing them towards you with my air, and they are being compressed into a wave shape. This is also known as a sound wave. Uh, technically, it's compression, but we call it a sound wave. Uh, now, one of the great things about a sound wave, I think it's very interesting, is the fact when a sound wave comes to you, 
it's being pushed by two things. The air that I give it, but then there's another interesting happens. The air pushes it so far, but then the air dissipates. And when it does, it creates right behind the sound wave. If, if my hand were a sound wave, right behind it, there is a vacuum area. And that vacuum, you know what a vacuum does? It sucks in air. And so when that sound wave is moving and sucks in air, that air then pushes it further. I can yell and make it go far, but the sound wave is going to carry it even further. And there's a lot of things that uh, help that, such as in a room where there's no carpet or anything, you will get a reverb from the walls or from the ceiling or from the floor. And that sound then accentuates the original compression wave and sends it even further. But it also, if it hits a wall, it sends it back to the source. We call that an echo. All these things go into a sound wave and that space behind the sound wave, that's called a rarefaction. It's interesting because the rarefaction, what's rare and rarefaction? Oxygen is rare because it's gone. Um, but those two things together, compression wave and rarefaction, or what sends the sound out. Now, the next slide uh, changes subject, but I, I like to throw this in because this power of a compression wave in, in the ancient days, uh, people would look at it and they think, well, there's power in that. We can hear that. Doctors thought it may have the ability to heal. And there's a long story here, and I'm going to try to sort of cut it down, but I did want you to think about it, that in the Middle Eastern area, what today is known as Persia and Iraq, they had the empire and uh, there around Baghdad. And a lot of those people were very smart. They worked with elixirs and using material and creating medicines. Meanwhile, over in Egypt, you had a different culture. They also added the idea of sound. They felt like that sound could help with the healing of things. And so they began to create incantations. Uh, and from there, the, you put the two together because eventually they did come together, medicines and incantations, and you had what the early middle medieval people called witchcraft. Witches were always stirring up or stirring up uh, medicines you know, with their eye of toad, wing of bat, and all that stuff. But at the same time, they had magic words, they would say. That carried through all the way to the American... Uh, entertainment industry where as a child I would hear a magician he would stand over his hat and say abracadabra that was an ancient incantation uh, and it actually was one of the incantations but they would put together words and what was important was what makes a wizard from a regular person and if you got any Harry Potter fans remember when they were in their class and they were learning to cast these spells and and they would say I can't remember what it was something like experiamus and some people it worked, some people it didn't. For those that didn't work, they were using the wrong inflection to create the, the vibrations. As the Egyptians felt that the inca incantation was just the words, the sound, but you had to say it at the right pitch, at the right speed. And that's where wizards got their training, was learning to say those words at the right pitch and speed so the incantation worked. And that leads us to this slide, because... Particularly in some of these Inca cultures, they would call it the doctrine of ethos. Uh, and that means that you use sound to heal. And they felt that vibrations and healing went together. So if you could have a certain sound over a wound, it would, it would get the tissue to heal faster. Uh, and so they didn't have a lot of other medicine. I guess it's the one that worked. And so if a guy is saying the right words or playing the right sound... Particularly, a different culture would be India. If you go to India, uh, they have various sounds that enhance the internal ideas of healing. They're called chakras, and if you know anything about meditation, you know that you have, uh, I think, nine chakras that line up from your head down to your waist. And sounds will affect each chakra and allow them to align and give you better health, more power. All of this is about sound. In the Greek mindset, where the doctrine of Athos comes from, uh, they felt like music could be played. Now, this is not unusual because even in the Bible, we have a story of uh, young David, whenever Saul would have one of his fits, which today they think he probably had some sort of 
a psychotic fit or uh, maybe even epilepsy. But David would play his harp and sing and it would calm Saul. And it, they said, well, David can cure it with his voice and his songs. So we have music being used. Today, we come back to that. We have classes on music therapy, you know, to help calm people, to relax their, you know, and relaxation helps with blood pressure and all sorts of things. So the idea is not as remote as we might think, but this all goes back to the power of music and how it combines with healing of the mind and body. Uh, I like, personally, I like to go to bed at night listening to smooth jazz. Uh, and I turn it really low. Sometimes I wear headphones, which I probably shouldn't do, but I turn it really low to where I just hear very soft and smooth jazz in the background, and I go to sleep. It's grown-up lullaby, you might say. But this is what this article, and I just wanted you to read a little bit, uh, and you can see what's going on with music and healing. Now, on the next slide, it's called Producing a Sound. Here, I want you to look at the mechanisms of how sounds are made. And you have, uh, it breaks out to the center of vocal production, which is all this area. And by the way, on the next slide, I think, yeah, the next slide, you'll see this in a diagram form. Uh, but it talks about first the diaphragm, which is a muscle which sits right below the lungs and right above the stomach. It's crucial in our breathing. Uh, and it's sort of tucked up under the ribcage to protect it, because if you hit the diaphragm, you can sort of paralyze it for a moment. And if you've ever had a situation where you've fallen or been hit and you say, well, I had the wind knocked out of me, what that actually was is that something struck the diaphragm and it stopped working for a moment. And if it doesn't work, you can't pull air in or push air out. That's what the diaphragm does. And so you feel like you're suffocating. And then the diaphragm snaps back, uh, usually on its own. In martial arts, uh, Martial artists are taught to try to punch someone in the diaphragm with an upward thrust, and you can knock them down, and they're not necessarily knocked out, but they think they're going to be knocked out, or they think they're going to die. Uh, it's a very fact, effective weapon. In singing, we train the diaphragm to control the flow of air so that that air can be pushed through the lungs, and you can hold notes out for a very long time or even produce very loud sound effects. Opera singers learn to control the diaphragm. Those are the muscles which control the air supply. Next, you have what is known as the vocal folds or larynx. What we used to call the voice box, it's here in the throat. Uh, that larynx is basically some, a cartilage protection over the vocal folds, which are two folds that are flexible. And when the air passes over them, they, they stretch and they contract. The amazing thing there is that the brain tells them how the stretch will contract. As a baby, as an infant, you know, babies cry. Then they learn to speak words. And what they're doing is they're hearing it and then they're translating that thought to the larynx so that when a child says, mama, he uses his mouth, but he also uses his larynx to say, ah, ah, to ah sound. And then puts the lips in with mama or da, da. Uh, and the, the child begins to learn how to speak. If there's some kind of brain uh, inhibitor, then the child may not learn to speak because he may not be able to hear. But if you've ever had a little brother and sister, you know, everybody sits around speaking words to them. That's one how you teach a child to speak. They first hear it and then they mimic it. Uh, and it happens with the vocal folds or the larynx. After that, you have what's known as the head resonant chamber. So that's up here in the head. Sound coming out of your mouth. And I wished I had my balloon. Usually I carry one. I'd look to see if it was laying on the floor. But if you take a balloon and blow it up and then pinch the end and let the air pass, you know you'll hear a loud screaming whining noise. If you re release that, it just goes and the air goes flying out. This is essentially what happens here. The larynx can be loose and it will make a low sounding vibration, that sound. If you squeeze it, it makes a very high sounding. Uh, but those that's all the sound. If you were to Remove your head and just hear the larynx. It would just be air passing through there like it were passing through a balloon. So what happens to that? That vibration comes up into the resonant areas. If you look at the diagram, you will see the blue thing on the diagram on the next slide is the larynx area. And then up from that, you'll see the tone, that big curved orange thing in the picture. And then you see the mouth, the soft palate, the hard palate, the nose. All these things vibrate. 
And as they do, you have almost like a portable echo chamber where the sound vibrates inside your mouth and then comes out. And that sound pushes the air and with it, it carries the vibrations at a certain frequency or vibration, speed of vibration. So that's how we produce the sound. So I encourage you to read that, look at it. And then uh, on the next one, I believe, I, let me double check. But after that slide, after slide three, slide four is the one we are just talking about. Slide five, there's their diaphragm. And then I want you to look. There are two videos here. Um, they're on YouTube, and you just click on those on the transcript that I'm going to post, and it will take you to these videos. One of them is a doctor doing a um, endos endoscopy where they put a throat down someone's nose and run it back, and you can literally see the vocal folds as they're forming the words. And the person that's doing it, they will make ah and e vowels, and then they'll speak, and you can see these things. Now, when you see those two folds uh, moving, and I think the doctor even says that, you're actually seeing them slow down because the, the camera can't catch how fast they move. And that's another amazing thing. They're moving very quickly. Uh, but anyway, you'll see that. And then I put another video on there to show you what people can do with this ability to speak. Uh, this guy's name is Tom Thumb. He's a professional uh, vocalist in the, in, well, I guess you really call him more of a professional beatbox guy. But he's incredible the way he can use his voice to create various sounds. Uh, and I won't tell you a lot about it. Just look at it. It's entertaining. Uh, from there, there is... Let me make sure. The there, I was looking at my slide five. I think I may have. Yeah, I forgot to list slide six, but the, the next one is slide six. Uh, and we go from the sound to actually hearing the sound. We create the sound, and then your next slide, slide six, is hearing the sound. This one always blows me away because when when you look at this and by the way there's another video which uh this guy explains the process uh and when you look at this video i'm not going to tell you a whole lot about it except for one thing which I, is in the transcript he talks about the sound coming and i'm looking at this diagram by the way he talks about the sound coming in the ear canal and passing through the middle ear but when it gets to the inner ear that's where a lot of the excitement really is the inner ear is back in here. It's full of fluid. And when the vibration is sent to it, it gets the fluid to vibrating. The only thing he doesn't really mention enough, I think, is he talks about how that vibrating fluid, you know, is sent to the auditory nerve. Well, he left out one very important step, which I always have to give you this brief sermon and lecture on. There are tiny cilia inside the cochlea, little tiny hairs, I call them. And they wave like seaweed in this fluid. And every time the vibration comes in, it stimulates these cilia. And they will carry that vibration to a nerve tip. And there's probably millions of cilia in your ear. They go from tiny to large so that they can handle high pitch frequencies and low pitch frequencies. And those cilia then will vibrate and they'll send that vibration to a nerve, which then transduces that vibration into an electronic wave, which is sent to the brain. When it gets to the brain, the brain receives it and interprets it, interprets it. All of this is happening in a split second, from you getting the vibration to the vibration being changed at least three times and turned into an electrical wave. Then the brain gets it and the brain sorts it out and turns it into something that you can understand. You are hearing words in your brain, but your ear is only hearing vibration. So it's only feeling the vibrations and then changing them. They, they change them through a mechanical wave, a fluidic wave, an electronic wave. You go from a compression wave, that sound wave, to mechanical, to fluid, to electronics. And when it becomes electronic wave, it goes to the brain and there is where that wave is interpreted as an actual word. So you know what I'm saying. But imagine this is happening in a split second. This is what's amazing to me. So here's the lecture part. Uh, I think I put this in the transcript. We are oftentimes unaware of what we're doing to ourselves. Uh, case in point, I will be the example. 
I went to a rock concert when I was a young man, and there was these wall of speakers, and I thought, this is great. And I stood in front of one, and about halfway through the concert, my head felt like it was going to explode. I literally went and hid behind a brick pillar, and my head went away. And I was just overloading my senses with the sound. Now, I had a friend who was at that concert, and he and his date were sitting near that same speaker. And the girl I was with, uh, I said, you know, I hope you don't mind, but I'm feeling a little queasy. And she looked, she said, so am I. We went outside the concert hall to an ante room, you know, where you go in before you go in the big doors. We stood there for a few moments and I said, I think I need a breath of fresh air. And she said, yeah, me too. And we walked out on the porch. And when we got on the porch, we suddenly realized something, that the vibrations, I was actually thinking I was having a heart attack because I was having chest vibrations. But then I realized outside it was vibrating in sympathetic rhythm to the bass player. And we could hear the singer better. And we said, well, let's, you know, it was a beautiful night. I said, let's walk a little further away from the gym because the further away we got from the gym, the clearer the music was. We literally got almost the other side of campus, sat on the bench and enjoyed that concert. We didn't see the people, but the music was understandable. The next day, my friend and his date who had stayed for the whole concert, he was my roommate in college and we got up for an eight o'clock class and he wouldn't get out of bed. And I said, turn off your alarm clock and he couldn't hear me. I went over and literally had to yell at him, and he freaked out. He thought he was deaf. He said, I can't hear. I said, well, go to the infirmary. He went to the doctor. The doctor said, I've seen about 30 people today. They have temporary deafness, uh, but it'll clear up as the day goes on. And that's when I found out about cilia. What happens? Those little cilia in the cochlea, if they're overstimulated, they will either pull in, recess, or they will lay down, just like you stepped on a blade of grass. And when that happens, the fluid wave can't get the message to the auditory nerve. And so you can't hear, you're effectively deaf. If it happens on a permanent basis, you're deaf forever. Uh, there's a procedure now where people will add auditory implants into people's head, you may have seen them, that does what the cochlea is no longer doing so that they can hear and they can tune those frequencies. But my point is, I would always warn you, be careful with loud noises. Remember a moment ago I said, I, I listened to headphones, uh, but I try not to turn them up loud because what you hear is relative to what's going on around you. Um, a good example is if you drove to school, today you're going to go out and get in your car. And the first thing you'll do is crank the engine. Well, there's engine noise. Second thing is you'll probably have the radio play and there's radio noise. Then you'll drive out on the highway. That's highway noise. And if your favorite song comes on, you'll probably turn over and turn it louder because... You want to block out the engine and the highway. Plus, there's going to be wind noise. If it's raining, you're going to have wind. All this noise. We never think about those noises because it's like that's just the way it is. But what we're doing is we're feeding all this into our brain. And when the noises go away, suddenly realize the radio is blaring. You reach over and you have to turn it down. It's too loud. But in order to hear it, you feed yourself too much noise. Uh, I, I pulled up beside a guy one day and his car was shaking. And he had this wonderful beat going, but his trunk was rattling and he was in there rocking his head. And I, all I could think of was, you know, at least to roll the windows down, your, your head's going to explode. Or when you get to be 50 years old, you'll be deaf as, as a doornail. Uh, but we see more of this problem because now we have super headphones, you know, whether it's Beats or earbuds, whatever you use. People use them and they use it to block out noise. And that's the wrong thing to do. If you want to block out noise, take the earbuds out and put actual earplugs in. But there's my lecture. There's my grandpa warning to young people who they find themselves going deaf. And I say it because I did damage to my ears. Uh, I used to listen to heavy metal rock and roll music. And now uh, I've got some damage to one of my ears and you know, a little, little bit of deafness. That's rough for a musician. Anyway. Read over that, look at the video, and think about that, and then you'll come to a slide, it is slide seven, which talks about three ways of listening. This goes back to what we talked about a little bit earlier in the previous lesson about how we listen, because we engage in art, we engage in music, and we do it on three levels. I have emotionally, that's when you hear a sad song, you, you can be sad. 
We have physical. That's when we hear something that encourages us to dance or to move. Uh, the most complete way is analytical. And you do that and don't even know you're doing it. But if you listen to a song and you find yourself memorizing the lyrics, you are analyzing what you hear and incorporating it. Uh, a lot of people will say, well, what is that sound? You know, is that a guitar? Is that a piano? Is that a bass? Is that a track? Uh, who's the background? That is part of the analysis as you begin to break it down into its various parts and understand it. And that's the best way of listening if you want to fully understand the music. But a lot of people just think, hey, this is recreational music. Forget about it. Uh, but anyway, that's just more. Now, the final, there's a test. And notice these terms. Uh, you've got all these terms, and all I want you to do is to define them to let me know. And you've got the PowerPoint. You can look right at it. But also, I want you to challenge yourself to look and to look at these terms, apply them, and think. This one, more so for your own well-being, because you have to protect your vocal mechanism by not screaming and yelling. I know some of you have gone to a football game before COVID, and you're screaming for your team. The next day you wake up, and it's like, well, I'm talking like this. I can hardly talk, because we damaged the vocal mechanism. But it will come back. Fortunately, it's pretty sturdy. Same way with your ears. We can crash them full of noise. And most of the time, they will come back. But what you don't know is every time you load those ears up and, and cause a little bit of temporary deafness, you kill some of the cilia. Good news is, you got a lot of them. Bad news is, you live a long time, you're going to be killing those cilia left and right unless you turn the volume down a little bit. I encourage you to take a moment to find a quiet place and just stop and sit and listen to silence. It will be enlightening. It's sort of a meditative thing. But anyway, um, that takes us all the way through lesson two. This lesson is sort of short, uh, but I think you'll find it enjoyable. I do encourage you to watch all the videos because there's a lot of good information in them. Do the test, send it to me, and we'll be ready to move on to lesson three. Now, I notice on the roll that we've had more people joining the class as we get along. Some have now been able to access Blackboard. Remember, look on Blackboard frequently Read the announcements, and you'll see when I say I'm posting such and such. By this afternoon or today, you should be able to see that I've posted Lesson 2, uh, and then next week it'll be Lesson 3. But I usually don't send you an email. I try to communicate through the announcements and through the postings and through these lectures. So this will be up probably within the hour. But Well, you don't know when the hour is, but you'll see it soon. But I thank you. I appreciate the work that's been sent in. You're doing fine. Continue the good work. And like I said, only send in the test in Word format. Uh, don't send it through Blackboard because it gets lost somewhere in, in the cosmos usually. Uh, and then you don't get a grade and then you get all upset and you start calling me. If you haven't uh, communicated with me, uh, I did send an a email out. But some of you, I think, have just recently registered. So you haven't seen that email, but just push on. Because once I start getting your assignments, I'll know that you're communicating. Uh, that's all I've got for today. And I'll be posting another lecture probably next week sometime. But thank you. And um, I'll you'll be hearing from me. Let's put it that way. Enjoy this lesson. I think it's a good one. Bye-bye.